In this video, I'd like to tell you about something that's called a network effect, otherwise known as a network externality. And it's actually a piece of economics, but it's a piece of economics that has been incredibly important to how the web has developed and to how we develop for the web these days. The classic example is the telephone. When Alexander Graham Bell invented his telephone, he had precisely one person that he could call, Thomas Watson. Now, this was a fantastic moment in the history of invention, but would you buy a telephone if the only two people in the world that you could call with it were Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Watson? Possibly not. The value of the telephone starts to go up as more and more people get telephones and you have more and more people that you can call. This is a network effect. The value of the product goes up as more and more people adopt it. So, why am I telling you about network effects in a course that's about programming for the web? Well, two reasons. The first is that an awful lot of web businesses have built their business models around network effects. So for instance, lots of people's friends are on Facebook. And when Google decided to introduce their competing network, Google+, they faced a bit of an uphill battle. No matter how much engineering effort they put into Google+, for lots of people, all their friends were on Facebook not on Google+. More importantly for you, however, network effects have been very, very important for how the web has developed. Just about every person on the planet has a browser that supports HTML and JavaScript. Now, these aren't necessarily the best designed languages for your next wonderfully interactive web application. HTML is hypertext markup language. It supports hypertext. Hypertext is text with links in it to other media and resources. So it's quite easy to say, I'd like a paragraph of text here. I'd like an image here. But what it's quite difficult to say is I would like a calendar widget here. It doesn't have that same sense of high level abstraction that many UI toolkits do. Similarly, JavaScript is very good for writing quite small applications, but it's got some aspects to it that can make it a little bit tricky when it comes to writing large structured web applications. So a few years ago, Google again came up with a language they called Dart that they think is better for writing large structured web applications. They released it together with a virtual machine that theoretically could replace the JavaScript virtual machine that's inside most people's web browsers. But, of course, just about everybody on the planet has a browser that supports HTML and JavaScript. So all of the people writing for the web write things that are in HTML and JavaScript, not HTML and Dart. And so all of the browser providers, they focus on HTML and JavaScript, not on HTML and Dart. So Dart would face quite an uphill battle to replace JavaScript. But that's not the only way that you can use it. If you want to write your web application in Dart, you can write it in Dart, and you can have it compiled to JavaScript. It's not the only language that you can do this with. There's quite a few. So there's CoffeeScript and TypeScript are a couple of popular examples, but there's more and more languages springing up all the time. So this is how network effects have driven the development of the web that pushing it to develop on top of the technologies that have already been widely adopted rather than replacing them. But, of course, something else has happened. Lots and lots of people now have smartphones. And when you get a smartphone, you don't just get a smartphone with a browser on it, it also has a native app toolkit. And if you've got a small device that doesn't have a permanent keyboard, it's an awful lot easier to pick an app icon from the grid of icons than it is to type a web address into a URL bar. So people with smartphones tend to interact with apps more than they interact with the web browser. So this makes the situation a little bit more complicated. You've now got various different kinds of client that are accessing your web service over HTTP, over the same sorts of protocol. You've got native apps nat uh, in the mobile market and you've got browsers in the desktop market. So one of the things I would recommend really early on is to think about when you're writing your program how you can make the 
logic of your program separate to what it produces. Don't tie it too closely to producing HTML because if your website, if your web application is successful, you will almost certainly find yourself wanting to write a native app for it as well. One of the other techniques that's risen in recent years is what's called a single page app. And this is essentially where to the browser, we initially de deliver some HTML and some JavaScript. And from there on, we get that HTML and JavaScript to make the browser behave like it's another app client communicating over HTTP. And instead of going to new pages, updating the existing one using JavaScript. And later on in the course, we'll see one particular framework that might help you to do that.